Uh, my name is Sam Arner. I am, um, as of March of 2020, I became the Collier and Lee County um, Horseshoe Crab Watch Volunteer Coordinator for um, Collier and Lee County. Um, I'm also the Animal Care Coordinator at the Conservancy, but these two projects are not related. Um, I just decided that I needed something else to keep fill my time. Um, so that's kind of where the Horseshoe Crab Watch project came in. Um, I was actually finishing up my master's program and I needed some sort of leadership project and I thought horseshoe crabs were really cool and so I reached out to FWC and realized that nobody had been doing horseshoe crab research south of Charlotte County and so I wanted to get it established here and we're working really hard to do that and so I hope today I encourage some of you to join um, but also just show you and teach you some really cool things about horseshoe crabs. Um, so here we go. So we're gonna be talking about what makes them so cool. I'm a little biased, but I think they're pretty neat. Um, why you should care about horseshoe crabs. So a lot of times what I realize is we talk about how you can help things, um, but sometimes that why gets lost. And I think why is really important with conservation. So why we should care about these horseshoe crabs. What is linked with Luminous? So what is Florida Horseshoe Crab Watch? Why and how you can get involved? And then other community science initiatives for you. So while walking the beach might not be for everybody, um, you know, there are other things out there that can get you involved in science and make you a part of all this very valuable data that's being collected and shared around the world. Okay, so five reasons why horseshoe crabs are so cool. So reason number one, horseshoe crabs are living fossils. Um, I think a lot of people know this, but it really is crazy when you start putting numbers into it and really putting it in perspective. So horseshoe crabs first appeared about 445 million years ago, give or take, you know, a couple million. Um, but that's when they first really emerged and were seen um, in the fossil record. But um, there were physical changes that were very present during these times. However, about 200 million years ago, they actually seem to have stopped evolving. Um, physically, they remain unchanged, whether there's genetic changes and stuff, there might be slight adjustments, but physically unchanged for 200 million years, which is pretty crazy. That means they got it right pretty much the first time and they decided to stop. Um, and the fossil that's actually pictured above this tick mark on the timeline um, is Luminous Darwini, if I am saying that correctly. Um, and that went extinct 150 million years ago. Um, but it just kind of goes to show you that fossil looks very similar to the ones that you might see on our beaches today. And then this one here, my box is in the way here. Okay, so this one here is our Atlantic horseshoe crab, the one that you would see here, but there are actually four living species of horseshoe crabs on our planet today. One we have in the United States and it's in the Gulf, um, our Gulf Coast here, but it also goes up the Atlantic coast. Um, people have seen them, you know, up in New Jersey, uh, Massachusetts. So they really, um, you know, all along the coastline. And the other three species are actually found in Asia. But today we're gonna to focus mostly on our Atlantic horseshoe crab. Um, and fun fact is the Atlantic horseshoe crab is mostly related to that extinct, uh, the extinct um, limin Liminous uh, Darwini and um, than it is to our current species that are found in Asia. So there's a very close relationship there. Uh, reason number two, horseshoe crabs are not actually crabs, uh, which shocks some people. Some people already know this, um, but it's kind of cool when you can put it out on, you know, kind of map it out here. So um, arthropoda kind of branched off and um, it broke off into mandibulata and chelicerata. So, you know, big words, you know, that doesn't really matter. It, what more matters more is the grouping and understanding kind of how that split, um, how they're kind of split up. And so this split from modern day crustaceans, so like your crabs, your shrimp, uh, that happened 400 million years ago. So that was pretty, that happened pretty close to when horseshoe crabs were first um, believed to have 
you know, arrived on the planet or been created. And so, um, so that's what happened about 400 million years ago. And so you have your um, mandibulata, which is your insects, your crustaceans. Um, so all of those, um, all of those animals that fall under that, but then your chelicerata are your scorpions, your ticks and your spiders. And, but also horseshoe crabs are more closely related. And so you can kind of see on here where it falls in. Um, they're not, you know, directly related, but they still fall under that chelicerata category. So mandibulata. So again, your crustaceans, um, or sorry, yeah, your mandibulata, your crustaceans and your shrimp, um, they all have jaw limbs that make up their mandible. And so you can see it on this picture of the shrimp at the bottom here. Um, and so they've actually evolved to have specialized um, mandibles, which help them break up their food and chew their food. Whereas the chelicerata, they have specialized appendages. Um, and so there are these little feet on the horseshoe crab. And those actually are what tear up the food. And then they all have specialized little, they're kind of like fiber-like, um, you know, finger-like little projections. And they actually help um, mash up the food as it goes into their mouth and right into their stomach. So reason number three, um, horseshoe crabs are born for success. And so again, they remained physically unchanged for about, you know, 200 million years. So they really haven't needed to change anything. And so a lot of, you know, all the things that they had 200 million years ago, they still have them today. And so they have uh, multiple pairs of legs that help with feeding. And so a lot of times, you know, spiders have a lot of legs. Um, so it makes sense that horseshoe crabs do when you follow that, um, you know, this where species kind of branch off at. And so um, they, and all of these different legs have different, you know, different, um, they meet different needs. So the chelicerae, which I mentioned, which makes them part of that chelicerata um, grouping, they help with feeding. So that's what they really use to tear apart and break up their food um, before it enters their mouth. Then they also have their pedipal. So that's those first set of legs. And those first set of legs, um, they help with all of it. They'll grab onto food, they'll help push them around, but mostly um, we kind of relate those to mating. And so this horseshoe crab picture here is actually a female, um, but this one here, that's a male. And so they are different between the species once they reach a certain size. And so the females don't have these nice boxing um, boxing gloves, but those boxing gloves actually are what help the male kind of attach to the female. And they'll stay attached to a female for life sometimes. So um, sometimes you'll see a pair that are like swimming around and that male might be choosing to stay there, but he's also just gonna hold on because when that female goes to um, where the waves break, on the, you know, along the coastline, she's going to bury in the sand and start depositing her eggs, and he wants to be the first one to fertilize them. Uh, occasionally, you'll see, and this is kind of what we're looking for with um, Florida Horseshoe Crab Watch, but occasionally you'll see satellite males, and this is more common up north, but you'll see satellite males, which are males that come and attach either to a different side, part of the female or will attach to that male itself. Um, and then he'll start fertilizing those deposited eggs um, and hope that he can spread his genetics too. And sometimes you can get, you know, one, one pair, one attached pair and multiple satellites, which is pretty crazy. And we do see them here, but we see them more on like our outskirt islands. So like in the 10,000 islands or uh, Caxendus Pass, um, a lot of boaters will go out there and they'll see a big aggregation of mating um, horseshoe crabs, which is cool. Um, and then you have your legs for walking. So they need to get around. They most of the time are kind of like, you know, um, their mouth and their legs are going to be on the ocean floor. And then the rest of them is going to be face up. And so that's so that they can stir up the ground, um, find their food. Um, 
you know, so they really, they use most, of, most of their locomotion is done by walking. They do swim, but not, not super often. Um, and then they also have these pusher legs. So again, those can be used for locomotion. Um, but they also, and you can see they're kind of shaped funny, but they actually will stir up things in the sand um, in the hopes that they'll scare food out and kind of they can grab it or um, it also helps kind of push um, oxygen and stuff through their, like over their gills, which we'll look at next. Um, so horseshoe crabs have specialized gills, which makes them really cool, really hardy. Um, they have an operculum which you can see pointed to with the blue arrow. Um, and that actually helps um, kind of fan water over their gills. So just like fish, they have gills. So they, you know, they're breathing in the water. However, these specialized gills will actually trap, um, trap moisture. And so when they, you know, low tide, if they're feeding or they're mating, they can actually spend extended periods of time outside of the water. Um, and it, they can pull oxygen mole molecules from that trapped water inside of their gills. So they can spend extended periods of time outside of the water. And that's just a close up of those gills. Um, kind of freaky looking, but actually really cool when you know what their function is. So it's kind of their version of a lung. Um, and then they also have 10 eyes. Um, the two, the first two really stand out. It's your two compound eyes. So they're the ones, um, you know, when you're looking a horseshoe crab dead on, you can see them. And those assist in helping them find their mates. So locating, you know, a male versus, you know, a male trying to find a female to latch onto. Um, and those, here's a better, you know, visual, but um, yeah, those two compound eyes really help them find, find their mates. And then they have another series of eyes that we can't really see. Um, and most of them are along the top um, or the dorsal of their body. And they help really in detecting light. So horseshoe crabs, despite having those two compound eyes, they have terrible eyesight. They really don't make out images like we do. Um, they mostly just make out shapes. And, you know, light obviously helps with being able to detect shapes. So um, that's what a lot of these eyes help. And then also ultraviolet. So they can see ultraviolet light, uh, which is something that we can't really do. Um, a lot of animals can, a lot of animals will use ultraviolet light to follow like urine trails and things like that. Um, and then along their tail, they actually have photoreceptors, um, which kind of assist with the synchronizing of light and dark cycles. Um, so again, just another way to detect light changes, time of day. Um, and then actually on their underside, kind of near their mouth, they have another set of eyes. Again, can't see them, um, but it helps them while they're swimming. So I said most of the time they're going to be crawling and you're going to see them kind of crawling along the bottom. But horseshoe crabs can actually swim. But when they swim, they tend to flip themselves over and then swim upside down. Um, and they kind of use their tail and their, you know, their gills operculum to kind of help flop them through the water column. Um, and so, you know, when they're doing that, those eyes are gonna help them flip back over, or a lot of times they get pushed over by waves, especially when they're mating along the coastline. And so, those eyes on the bottom let them know, hey, I'm upside down, something's not right. Um, and then they'll use their tail to help flip them back over um, if they're just to right themselves. Um, horseshoe crabs are medical marvels and this could not be more true than right now. Um, horseshoe crab is vital in vaccine development and that includes COVID-19. Um, they were used very heavily this year um, in our vaccine development. And so, you know, there's pros and cons to it, of course, and we'll talk a little bit about those cons later. Um, but if you have gotten your vaccine or you are going to get your vaccine, um, you probably have horseshoe crabs to think. And so um, horseshoe crabs have a hemocyanin blood 
um, base blood. And so their blood is based uh, with uh, copper, which makes it blue. So they bleed blue. Um, and then unlike us, we have an iron based blood. And so that's why we bleed red, um, which is just a cool fun fact. Um, but because their blood has that copper base, it also makes it, you know, it makes it super, um, super special, especially for um, testing what they want to test it for. So their blue blood contains a substance called limin limulus amoebocyte lysate, which clumps in the presence of bacterial toxins. So what they use this copper-based blood for is to test for the presence of gram-negative bacteria. Um, so they'll test equipment, you know, see if it clumps in a spot. It's going to let them know that it's, you know, sterile, not sterile. Um, same thing with vaccines. They'll, you know, they'll use it for injections and stuff like that just to see, you know, how sterile that substance is. And then, um, so this was first discovered in the 1950s. And this immune defense, um, and that's really when it started taking off. They realized how vital it was um, in our, you know, medical equipment testing. Um, and so there is a sub substitute for it. Um, however, they it's more expensive. And so horseshoe crabs, you know, they're they're free essentially. You can go out, you can collect them. Um, and the substitute, it takes a lot longer to, re, uh, to produce and it's harder to get some of the supplies. So since the 1950s, we've been using them very heavily for this. Um, horseshoe crabs, yeah, I already said that. Okay, so there you can see in this picture, um, you can see that blue blood coming out of them. And, you know, this graphic, again, it's, you know, we have them to thank for our COVID-19 vaccines. However, you know, this picture just goes to show, um, you know, mass production of, you know, of this stuff um, and kind of how it's drawn. And so to me, it's very graphic, but um, you can see the blue blood, you can see how it's done. Um, horseshoe crabs also play a really important role in um, vision studies. So because they have so many, so many eyes and they have so many different types and they have so many different roles, um, it's played a really important part in understanding our own vision and kind of developing contact lenses um, and various things along those lines. And then our fifth reason, our last reason, but not the only reasons, but um, the last one that I'm going to highlight is um, horseshoe crabs are a keystone species. So a keystone species are one of those animals that if you remove it from, you know, the web, from, you know, all the other species, things start to collapse. Um, and so horseshoe crabs are really important for, um, a food source for a lot of different animals. So, you know, you think of your sharks who might eat them, like your nurse sharks, or you have sea turtles who might eat them. Um, and then we have, you know, other uh, crustaceans that might eat them if they have deceased, or, you know, birds who birds will eat mostly their eggs. And so, horseshoe crabs spawn, spawn along the coastlines of Gulf of Mexico and the Atlantic Ocean. Um, and during that time, like I said, the female will deposit her eggs, the males will try and fertilize them. But as they're doing so, a lot of birds will, um, and this tends to take place during migration time. So a lot of birds will swing by and, you know, eat as many eggs as they can before they have to take off again. Um, and so the really big thing, especially as we see horseshoe crab numbers declining, um, we see an effect with the red knots. And so red knots are a near threatened species and they are known to um, basically survive their migration based on these horseshoe crab eggs. And so here's just some pictures of them eating them. So you can see they take them by the mouthful. Um, and what's really important, so red knots make a very long migration, about 19,000 miles give or take a couple thousand. 
Um, but it's a really important fuel for them to be able to make their entire migration. Um, and so without enough eggs to feed all of these red knots, you know, they might have to turn to a different food source or there might not be a food source for them at all. Um, so, you know, we started to touch on this um, a little bit, but we'll kind of dig into it a little deeper. Um, I wanted to know real quick though, if anyone has any questions before I continue. And if not, that's okay. We can, you know, you can ask me any questions at the end or I'll give you my email address to also email me. Um, so yeah, don't be shy. Uh, I also don't wanna claim to be a super expert on anything. I just, I found horseshoe crabs to be a lot of fun. And so I decided I wanted to start working with them and there's a lot to cover with horseshoe crabs. So, you know, I might not know the answers but I'll do my best to find the answers for you later. Um, so threats to horseshoe crabs. So there are four main threats to horseshoe crabs um, throughout the world. Um, so not only just affecting our Atlantic horseshoe crab, but also those three horseshoe crabs that are over in Asia. Um, so the biggest past threat, it's not really as big of an issue now, which is good, but the eel and whelk fisheries um, was really big. So uh, basically, they would catch horseshoe crabs just to use them as bait in order to catch these other things. Um, and so they kind of, they were just being used to hunt for other things. And so in 1999, over 300 million horseshoe crabs were collected annually for bait. Um, today, that has dropped down. That is less, which is good. And that's why I say it's kind of like more of a past issue. But clearly, you know, the more we harvest, the, you know, the more these things are going to deplete. Um, so, you know, today there's about 750,000 horseshoe crabs harvested annually. And there, the reason of this drop is because there were more regulations put onto the fishery, um, and also people are becoming a little more aware. Um, so, you know, awareness goes a long way. The biomedical industry still, again, like I said, very big um, issue and threat to horseshoe crabs. Um, they're still very heavily used for this. So just in 2015, 220 million milliliters of blood were collected, um, which is about, you know, 70,000 individuals. Um, you know, give or take again, that were collected in 2016. So that's a lot of blood, um, you know, and they take about 40%. Yeah, they take about 40% of their blood each time. So as you can see in the pictures, they will um, kind of bleed them out, take about 40%, and then they basically release them right away. They might give them maybe a 24-hour recovery time, but then they release them back into the wild. Um, and until recently, there weren't that many studies done on, um, you know, on their survival rate afterwards. And so they kind of had a guess, but then when they really started looking into it, you know, it's about 5 to 30% that reported not to survive. Um, but then as I was doing even more research for school, I found another study that had a 78% mortality rate. So it still is a very understudied, under, under, misunderstood. Um, and so we really don't know exactly how many we're losing once they dump them back out there. Um, habitat loss. So, you know, people love living along the coast. And, but a lot of animals also like to use the coast. And as we're developing, we're also taking away a lot of their space to do the things that they need to do. So, um, you know, they like these sandy beaches that don't have a lot of people, a lot of attention. Um, you know, they also like if they're mating at the night at night, they're not going to want a lot of light pollution either. And so, you know, as we're kind of building up our coastlines, we really are taking even if the beach is still there, we might still be taking habitat away from them. And so, 
you know, just kind of being, we need smart growth. We need, you know, to really think about where we're developing and also start to talk about how to eliminate and lessen some of that coastal development. Um, and then this one really surprised me uh, while I was getting trained up for Florida Horseshoe Crab Watch, but the aquarium trade is the number one um, issue to uh, the Atlantic Horseshoe Crab here in Florida. Um, we have the aquarium trade. It's an easy place for import and export. And so a lot of um, a lot of companies will collect here so that they can ship it out really easily. And the issue, so when they're doing the biomedical studies, they're collecting adult horseshoe crabs. They're collecting them when they have reached their prime, um, hopefully after they've had a chance to you know, contribute their genetics. But in the aquarium trade, a lot of these uh, horseshoe crabs are young. They, you know, they're freshly hatched and that's because aquariums want them to be able to grow, not take up as much space. Um, so that's really kind of one of the main things that they're trying to tackle here now is kind of regulating this aquarium trade and the selling of horseshoe crabs um, in the field. Okay, so um, horseshoe crabs are key players in, um, in ecology and, you know, all of the fun things here. So protecting them are vital for many of reasons, but, you know, just to kind of reiterate what we had talked about, you know, protecting horseshoe crabs is going to protect also other wildlife populations. So, you know, raccoons will eat them, fish, crabs, sea turtles, shorebirds. So, you know, why we want to protect them, you know, we want to protect them because we want to protect our other, you know, fauna of Florida. And then also, you know, preserving coastal environments. So horseshoe crabs need these sandy, sandy habitats, as I said, to lay their eggs. Um, but they also live along these coastlines and that's where they find their food. That's where they, you know, hide out, um, especially like during storms and stuff. And so they need these healthy ocean systems um, just for survival. And, um, and they're also really important actually in aerate, helping aerate the sand. And so having them around, you know, helps stir things up in there. And that way you're not having all this like funk kind of just like sitting on that ocean floor. Um, and then they're still going to be important, even if we switch to a substitute, they're still going to be important for um, the development of medicines, advancing medicines. So they're going to help us develop new techniques. Um, hopefully we can establish, um, hopefully we can get away from using horseshoe crabs, but in the meantime, hopefully we can find better ways that, you know, don't, don't have such a high mortality rate, um, but it'll also help us, it can help us advance, you know, again, more of those like, um, you know, testing contact lenses and, you know, other, you know, how to develop other medical equipments and things like that. Because they are so hardy and their immune systems are so good, we have a lot to learn. Um, and so hopefully we can just get away from you know, how heavily they're exploited in that process and kind of start to learn to step away from them. Okay, so kind of what, why horseshoe, or how horseshoe crabs kind of brought me to, you know, Florida Horseshoe Crab Watch. Um, you know, as I said, I was really excited about learning about them. And, you know, I, again, I work at the Conservancy and we have horseshoe crabs of our own in our touch tank. And so I kind of exploring this journey made me really think about it because again, the aquarium trade is the number one, you know, problem here in Florida. And so, you know, it took me as the animal care coordinator, it kind of made me think about how I could, you know, do things different, um, especially with housing horseshoe crabs. And so we really make it a point, you know, we we'll get horseshoe crabs, we'll collect them ourselves. I don't, you know, I don't buy them out from anybody and we'll actually raise them, you know, for a couple of years until they're a mature horseshoe crab and then we'll release, release them back out into the ocean where we collected them from. Um, 
So I had worked with them for a couple of years, but then, you know, as I said, I was getting my master's and I just wanted, I wanted to kind of get community me members and like get people who like science, but are afraid or feel, um, feel that they're not welcome in the scientific community. So I wanted to give them a chance to kind of get into this field and explore. And so that's kind of how Florida Horseshoe Crab Watch came to be in Collier and Lee County. And so um, again, at the end of this, I will give you my email. Um, and if you're interested, please reach out. I'm really looking, I have some places established in Collier, but we're really looking to get more volunteers in Lee County. So if anyone is interested, please, please, please reach out. But, okay. So in this uh, Florida Horseshoe Crab Watch is a new program. It was first established in 2015, and it's a collaboration between Florida Fish and Wildlife um, and the University of Florida. And so together they came together and just said, hey, we need to look what's going on. We need to collect data because if we want to protect them, we have no idea what's happening with horseshoe crabs in our area. Um, so it's, you know, the goal to understand, um, to gain an understanding of horseshoe crab populations throughout the state. Um, so that's ultimately what they're striving for. Um, and they're using scientific protocols and tools um, and giving community members the chance to assist in the data collection. They help with the tagging um, and they help with uh, reporting, um, you know, reciting data. So, um, and as I said, until 2020, uh, when I first reached out to FWC, there no efforts had been able to be like fully established south of Charlotte County. So that's what we're really trying to do is get us down here. And this map here uh, just shows you, you know, where throughout the county um, there are programs versus there aren't, or where they would like to start establishing programs. So. Uh, green is kind of where they're trying to at this point in time. All right, so um, basically, this is the, these next couple slides are going to be kind of what we do on the project. So, um, what we're looking for right now is basically, and right now is the prime time. So um, March, April, and then uh, I think September, October are the prime mating times for these horseshoe crabs. And so they will, you know, congregate onto the beaches like this. And so this picture right here is, um, this is more north. So we haven't seen this here yet. We're hoping we see it, but I'm a little doubtful. Um, but they, you know, there's like a, some females in there, but then all these males also will join. And so again, they're trying to fertilize, they congregate and, you know, on windy days, they tend to like, um, they like the wave action because it helps like oxygenate the area. Um, and they also tend to not like um, super populated, you know, beaches with a lot of people. Um, so our volunteers go out and look for this. And so again, um, you know, you'll have a, a female and then a male attaches, but then all these other males come to join. And so we call those, you know, a pair with a bunch of satellite males. And so we're going out looking for them. And then when our volunteers actually find these horseshoe crabs, they are collecting them. Um, so they will, they will um, remove them from the water and we actually take them back. Um, we, we keep them on the beach, but we you know, put them in a bucket, we weigh them because we're trying to, you know, determine, you know, how big males are versus females. Um, and then we also uh, measure their carapace length. So we'll, we have a little ruler and we, you know, measure their lengths and then um, we will tag them. So these tags, there's, you know, different tags for males and females, but um, we're essentially, tagging them to see if they're coming back to those areas. So we really want to know, are these particular individuals coming back to these same sites or are they traveling up the coast, down the coast? Um, do we only see these particular individuals during certain temperatures, tides, wind conditions, things like that. So that's really what we're looking for. Um, and because horseshoe crabs are really good at coagulating so their blood um you know they don't 
they don't bleed out um, significantly. So these tags, you know, as soon as they go in, there's no more harm to these horseshoe crabs. So they uh, they heal up almost instantaneously, which is crazy. Um, so linked with luminous uh, Florida horseshoe crab watch is giving scientists an understanding of horseshoe crab populations throughout Florida. Um, so if you want to be part of those efforts, you can really help scientists collect this data and, um, you know, put it to good conservation use. Um, and then it's also giving scientists an understanding of their spawning behaviors. So, you know, in northern Florida, where Florida Horseshoe Crab Watch has been established for a couple years, they tend to know a lot more. But since we don't we don't have anything down here. We don't have really any data. Um, we're kind of learning that horseshoe crabs don't follow the same patterns in South Florida as they do in other places of Florida. So especially Southwest Florida and the Florida Keys, we don't get those big congregations. Um, it also seems that uh, temperature um, we have warmer seasons uh, throughout most of the year. And so it seems that horseshoe crabs spawn all year long here, which might be why we don't get those big congregations because they might be able, they might be able to just lay their eggs when they feel ready. Um, and then also um, they don't seem to follow the um, windy day, super high tide pattern. Um, and so we're really, what we're really trying to do is figure out what they like. Um, and right now, we're not really, again, we're not sure. We have two tagging sites established and we've seen mating pairs at both, but it's very infrequent. Um, and so it's just right now, we're all just kind of figuring it out together. And I have a handful of volunteers and, you know, it's very, you know, it's very hit or miss, but it's fun because we're all kind of figuring it out. And when we see one, we get very, very excited. Um, and then it's giving you, you know, it's giving regular community members who maybe had never had that opportunity with science to get out there and collect and educate others. So you're collecting data, but you also have the chance to teach somebody something new, which is really cool. Um, so like I said, I have two sites established, um, one in Collier, one in Lee. Um, so in uh, Collier County, we do Tiger Tail Beach. Um, the reason I chose this is because based on reports just from people throughout the county, tiger tail was one of our highest um, that people could get to. Like I said, we tend to have higher numbers on, you know, satellite islands that are harder for volunteers to get to. So tiger tail is one of the only places that I can get groups of volunteers to easily. Um, so we uh, sample right in the lagoon and we just walk that I don't know if you guys saw that red mark just pop up but that's where we walk and we just kind of walk back and forth on that small stretch and we walk in the water because usually we go during high tide so we'll walk in the water and see if we stir a mating pair up. Um, again I've seen one or two out there but not many since we've started. Um, this was actually from one of our volunteers, this picture. Um, it was just a mating pair that was, they were just crawling along on the ocean during high tide at Tiger Tail. Um, I think it was back in September. And then um, I, you know, COVID really put a twist and a damper in all of this. Um, so it's been hard for me to get out there with volunteers, but I recently just started um, you know, meeting up with all of them, finally masks, social distancing, and we didn't find any crabs, but I decided to, um, you know, get some practice in by cutting out my own horseshoe crabs and tagging them so that everyone could see the process. So really just trying to get people hands on and kind of, you know, seeing what it's all about and what we would do if we actually found the horseshoe crabs. Um, and then Bunch Beach in Lee County. Bunch Beach is beautiful. So if you've never been, I highly encourage you to go out. Um, but we sample the uh, more northern tip of Bunch Beach. So 
you have, you know, where the parking is along the side of the road. Um, and then we just walk north until we can't really walk anymore. And then we walk back down south. Um, and we just, you know, any horseshoe crabs we see along the way, those are the ones that we're going to be tagging, um, measuring, and collecting data on. Um, and so there in red is our transects line. Uh, so that's where volunteers walk. And both of these surveys, Tiger Tail and Bunch Beast, are less than a mile. So it's really, you know, it's a leisurely walk, but you do have to get wet because you have to get in the water. But um, it's not too, not too strenuous. Um, and then this is actually a pair, my first pair that I saw at Bunch Beach. So they're there. And I keep telling all my volunteers they're there. We just have to figure out when is the best time to find them. So how can you help? So if you're interested, um, you know, get involved. So if you aren't afraid of getting your feet wet, if you can walk about a mile in the sand, um, you know, and if you can tolerate extreme heat and weather conditions, because this is Florida, um, this is Southwest Florida, so you know those extreme weather conditions, um, then yeah, please contact me. Uh, this is my email. Again, I'll put it in the chat, you know, once, once I wrap up, but you know, contact me, uh, get some more information. I can, you know, we're doing a virtual training so that you can, you know, learn all the biology, the history, um, the different methods, and then, you know, we'll do our best to get you out in the field and, you know, really get in some hands-on science. Uh, report sightings of horseshoe crabs. So if you don't want to get involved, that's fine. I understand, you know, we all have fun things we want to do. So, um, if you spot live or dead horseshoe crabs, not molts, so horseshoe crabs do molt and a lot of people um, will report, you know, the molt, but what happens is the horseshoe crabs will actually climb out of that outer shell and then they'll go and bury in the sand for it to harden again. So, you know, if you find a live or dead one and you'll know it's dead because it'll smell, um, you know, please report it and you can actually report it um, via this very long link that I will attach into the, um, the chat then. Um, or there, the easier method is you can download the FWC reporter app, um, and then you can report it on your cell phone. And that is the icon. So the thing that just popped up, that is the icon, um, of the app. And they have it both for iPhone and Android. Um, and then you can support um, beach protection and renourishment projects. So, you know, protecting these beaches is very important. And, you know, we all we one of the things we can do is kind of help support these um, these projects, do beach cleanups. Um, and when you're at the beach, you know, leave no trace behind. So do your best to clean up after yourself. Um, encourage others to clean up after themselves. Um, you know, these animals, this is their home. And so we want to leave as minimal of an impact as possible. If you live along the beach, along the coast at night, turn your lights off so that you're not just ranting or um, confusing any of the animals that use it, um, you know, during those time periods. Um, and if horseshoe crabs are not for you, really quickly, we're just, I'm going to give you some other fun uh, community science initiatives. So, like I said, community science is great because it helps people collect data for scientists. So science, um, as some of you might know, there's not a lot of money in it. There's not enough people and the people that are in it don't have enough time. And so, um, the benefits of community science is that we can get this data to scientists to make, you know, actual changes, conservation action, things like that. So again, download this FWC reporter app. You can report the horseshoe crabs, but you can also report so many other things. Um, you know, our recent red tide events, you could report fish kills, you can report abnormal fish. If you're a fisherman and you let you catch something really weird, you can report those. Um, birds, bats, nuisance wildlife. If you are a snorkeler or a diver and you see coral bleaching, you can report it. So there's a lot of options on that FWC reporter app. I naturalist. So, um, 
you know, post photos of your local wildlife sightings. Even if you don't join a project, you can take photos of things, post it, and people will help you identify it. So it's a really easy way to, you know, confirm that, you know, that bird you saw is the bird that you thought it was, or maybe it's like a really unique rare bird. And then, you know, people then can know they're in the area. Um, but places like Corkscrew, Del Norwigans, um, Pelican Bay and Sugden Park, they have projects started on iNaturalist. So if you frequent any of these areas or complexes, um, you know, check it, check them out and see if they have a project started that you can kind of contribute to and, you know, fun little initiative in your area. Um, eBird, so um, you can report your bird sightings, follow other birders, join other community birders, and contribute to scientific data collection. So, um, you know, this is really popular along the birding community, um, especially during migration. So everyone wants to know when certain species come back. And so if you join this, you can know if your favorite bird has migrated down yet from up north. Um, fish space. This one I'm still trying to like work out fully myself, but if you're a fisherman, um, you know, you can upload pictures of your catches to this uh, database and then, you know, they can help you ID, but you can also, you know, let them know, you know, fish in that area. Um, and they're just basically trying to compile a big list of fish in different species or in different areas. And there's more. So you can join Frog Watch. Um, so you, you have to go through a training for this one, but you can learn frog sounds and listen in your community and report that data. And it goes into a huge database. And frogs are really important because they're indicator species. of, And so they'll kind of let you know the presence of them or not presence of them. will let you know, um, you know, if an area is of good ecological health or declining. Um, North American Butterfly Association. So you can report sightings, um, participate in local counts, and create a new count. So this one is certain times of the year um, when certain species are more prevalent, but um, you can go on to, you can Google them, you can Google all of these and they'll pop up, but you can go onto their website and see if there's any uh, local ones that you could join. Uh, Nest Watch, you know, you take an online quiz, you, you know, get certified and then you can find a nest and kind of watch that nest, see when the, you know, see when eggs hatch and then uh, submit that data um, on either online or on a mobile app. And then if you really don't even want to go outside, you can do citizen science from your couch. So, there's options. Um, you can do Globe at Night um, where you can just like pop outside, take a photo of the constellations and then upload it. And it will, you know, it'll send all that data report to report on light pollution. Um, so depending on the constellations you see, it'll give you a level of light pollution in that area. And then Zooniverse, um, I did some exploring on Zooniverse and they have so many different projects. You can do whale vocalizations. Um, you can monitor bottom dwelling fish in Hawaii. You can monitor bears in changing environments. They have galaxies where you can like identify a galaxy versus you know something else uh, out in space. And you can do that all from your couch, which is just pretty amazing. Um, so there's a lot of opportunities out there and I encourage people, you know, explore some of these. Some might be for you, some might not be, but you know, any way that we can contribute to science and get more people involved and, you know, interested in all these different aspects of conservation is really helpful and very beneficial. Um, those are my resources. If anybody wants to check them out, there's a lot. Um, and then at this point, um, if anybody has any questions, I'm checking the chat now. I'm sorry. I'm really bad at chats. Um, but yeah, if anyone has any questions and they want to jump on and talk to me, you can. Again, my email's right there, so you can email me. Or do crabs die when you draw their blood? So not really during that initial blood drawing process. I'm sure some do and can die of stress, but it's really the after fact. Um, after they're released back into the ocean, that seems to be when mortality is 
the highest, but again, it's so understudied that it's not very well known. Um, do they only lay eggs during the daytime or is it tide dependent? Um, it seems that in most places it is very tide dependent, um, but again, we don't know much in, um, in Collier County, so don't know much. Um, off the top of my head, I don't know the exact number of eggs that they lay. Um, it's a lot. And, um, but how long do they live? So horseshoe crabs can live, you know, a decent amount of time. Obviously, it's going to be very dependent on uh, environmental conditions, things like that. They reach, let me get back to you because I'm, I'm getting numbers mixed up in my head. I know they molt like 16 times in their lifetime. And I want to say 20 something, but I have to double check on the lifespan, which I can do in a second. Um, what do horseshoe crabs eat? And does red tide have any influence? So um, horseshoe crabs are very opportunistic. So they're going to eat whatever they can get their little uh, chalicerae on. Um, and so they'll, you know, they've been known to eat, you know, clams, but a lot of times they'll eat dead decaying stuff. Um, in the sand. And so that's where it's really important for those feet to kind of mix things up and it might turn up something that's either dead or dying and then they can, you know, tear it apart and, um, and eat it. Uh, red tide does have an effect. Uh, I don't know that we know the, um, that like direct effect that it has, but just like all these other animals, you know, it works its way through the food chain. And so, if they're eating all these things that are already dying, if they're eating a dead fish, um, there's a very high chance that that's going to affect them sooner rather than later. Uh, a very interesting observation that we had during this last red tide, um, one of my coworkers went out to the beach and she found a lot, like within a small stretch, she found like six molts. So they weren't dead horseshoe crabs, but they were molts. And I don't know if feeling like feeding on those toxins and then feeling effects of those toxins kind of triggered them to go into a molt of some sort to like kind of a lot of animals like snakes and stuff if they feel icky they'll kind of shed that outer layer of their skin and so I don't know but I kind of think it might you know might be because they kind of feel something's off so they're you know molting to try and like recover um but yeah, so it has an effect. We just don't really know the level of it. Um, if you pick them up, will they bite you? Uh, no. So horseshoe crabs, um, they're very gentle. Uh, the biggest thing is if you poke them the wrong way, it might hurt because they have some sharp edges, but they won't they can't really hurt you. They might pinch you a little bit, but again, it I've never I've never been hurt by a horseshoe crab. And that tail, especially in this picture right here, that tail sticking up, um, that is just for riding themselves and for um, swimming around and directional. So it's not a stinger, it can't sting you. Um, the worst thing would be stepping on it, which would hurt. Um, but again, it's not like venom or anything like that. So, all right, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen green really quick. Does anyone else have any other questions? I'm going to look up lifespan really fast. Twenty years, yeah. So that's kind of what I was thinking. So they molt about 16 times throughout their life, but they can live for about 20 years. So. I was wondering, when you're collecting them to get your your data, are you interrupting breeding? I mean, if um, so technically, yes, um, because we are looking for those, um, you know, those that are mating, because that's what we're most interested in. However, um, that male stays attached pretty much through anything. Uh, so he's not really gonna let go. And you can usually 
put them back um, and they will continue undisturbed. So, because uh, when we're walking upon them, they are already, like they've already been kind of in that egg laying process. The males have been fertilizing um, and usually they'll just resort right back and continue. And we're not collecting, like here's a little different because we find so few. So if we find them, we're going to grab them, tag them, all that stuff. But it up north where they have those mass like mating congregations, they're only going to collect a handful of them. So they're not actually going to collect all of them and tag every single one. So. so they lay their eggs above the high tide line. Is that what it is? Yeah, yeah. So they kind of go up to that high tide line, they'll bury in the sand, she'll deposit those eggs, and then the males will fertilize. And from there, the eggs will kind of in that oxygenated, you know, sand, obviously, a lot of them will get pushed back, but um, they like that, like high tide, rough kind of surface. Um, it's well oxygenated. So when they, their rake, when they rake the beaches down here, are they raking down that far? Um, they, no, I mean, could they be disturbing? Yeah, I mean, 100% they could be. Um, yeah, there's a lot of issues with raking the beach. Um, you know, the horseshoe crabs aren't the only animals that would be affected by that. There's a lot of other animals that, you know, live in the sand or utilize that sand. Um, so... Yeah, it's not ideal. Um, and, you know, again, it comes with that balance of making the people happy and the wildlife happy. So, yeah, too bad they uh, come up during spring break, huh? Yeah, I mean, animals, man, they pick terrible times to do all these things, or we just pick terrible times to do our things. Um, yeah, so horseshoe crabs and uh, sea turtles, too, pick, you know, not great times of the year to do their nesting as well so okay thanks for answering my questions great presentation. yeah no problem um i went ahead and put some uh you know i put my email address in the chat if anybody wants that and then um the uh survey uh web address that you can report horseshoe crab sightings um we're really interested in mating sightings but you know if you find you know a, a one alone you can report that, and if you find a dead one, you can report that. Um, and then I also added the link to um, the fish base because that was the only web address that was super complicated and harder to find. Um, so if you're a fisherman and you want to, you know, take pictures and report the fish that you're finding um, to contribute to a database, you know, that's the web address that you can do that at. All right, well, if nobody has any other questions, again, feel free to email me. Um, yeah, and you know, I hope everyone, if you're not a part of science, you become a part of science.